Hi, my name is Dr. Amelia Averitt, and I'm very pleased to be speaking with you today about increasing the impact of machine learning with common data models. In this talk, I will discuss the benefits of deploying the same models to different data sets, identify some barriers to this task, and discuss how common data models can help address these barriers. We will follow an example throughout the talk today and finally discuss some successes in real-world applications of common data models. I'd like to begin by disclosing that I am an employee of Regeneron Pharmaceuticals and that I have a relevant relationship with commercial interests in this company. I'm sure that everybody listening is well aware that machine learning, or ML, is the study of computer algorithms that learn from data and improve automatically through training. Throughout this talk today, I will be discussing machine learning and artificial intelligence, or AI. And to be clear, I will be assuming that the relationship between these two disciplines exists as it appears here on the screen, where machine learning is a subset of AI and deep learning is a subset of machine learning. You may see the notation MLAI within the talk, and that is going to refer to classes of methods that fit into this diagram. To me, the most interesting tasks in machine learning are prediction and pattern recognition. These tasks can have a lot of different aims and purposes, particularly within pharmaceuticals and broader health research. They include things like phenotyping, drug discovery, causal inference, survival analysis, and forecasting. I'm going to be framing my talk today from the lens of causal inference, or the study of the relationship between cause and effect. It's my area of expertise, and I think that every interesting question can be boiled down into a causal question. But the principles that I will be discussing today can be applicable to many tasks and many questions. Regardless of the task, this is the machine learning pipeline that we're all very familiar with. We have an algorithm which we apply to data. This in turn gives us inferences regarding relationships between the features in our data. And then we hope that these inferences are reflective of real world and can be applied broadly. To put a finer point on this, let's suppose that we have a classifier to identify patients with probable non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, or NAFLD, from an electronic health record, or EHR, with diagnoses that are coded in SNOMED. From this, we want to learn which patients in our data likely have NAFLD, and then extrapolate beyond our data to identify others with likely NAFLD. Now, let's say a new data source arises, another EHR, but coded in something other than SNOMED. And let's pretend that this new data would support the exact same task as our original pipeline, the identification of NAFLD patients. This is great news. A secondary data source allows us to understand how our model and data interact with each other, to yield the inferences that we rely so heavily upon. It also helps us understand how the inferences we make relate to the real world. And it is important to note that assessments such as these really cannot be completed well in the absence of other data sets. Of note, we can apply the algorithm to the new data and make new inferences to compare to the original in exercises of reproducibility. We could take the exact model as in our original pipeline, apply it to new data, and assess transportability. We could apply the algorithm to many new data sources, compare the inferences in these, and assess replicability. We could maybe take all of these different inferences and meta-analyze them, or we can compare inferences from data sources to some theoretical gold standard, which would help us understand generalizability. All of these many, many important questions are only addressed in the presence of additional data sets, yet none of these inferences may be meaningfully comparable. And they may not be meaningfully comparable because the representation of the data is not consistent. If ML and AI models are meant to learn on this data and learn in a way that is consistent across data sets, a mismatch in the data representations can absolutely interfere with these exercises. And these exercises will be significantly much more complex than this very simple toy example that I have outlined here. A representation of the data that will enable machine learning models to make meaningful inferences from multiple data sources is preferred. Common data models, or CDNs, can help us with this. 
CDMs are a representation of biomedical data that standardizes entities, attributes, and relationships across multiple sources. There are a few CDMs for biomedical data out there, notably the Observational Medical Outcomes Partnership, or OMOP CDM, popularized by the Odyssey community, Sentinel, and the National Patient-Centered Clinical Research Network, or PCORnet. Others certainly exist, and I encourage you to explore, but all of these CDMs provide a roadmap that will take our varying and disparate data sources and transform them into the same codified representation. If we go back to our original example to identify patients with NAFLD, let's suppose that we have two data sources, each with one patient, and that these are represented on each side of the slide. And let's further assume that this slide contains all of the data in these data sets and that our machine learning models can learn patterns of NAFLD from this data. Data set one contains only ICD coded diagnoses for other chronic non alcoholic liver disease type 2 diabetes, and left upper quadrant pain. It also includes ethnicity data. Dataset 2 contains SNOMED-coded diagnoses for non-alcoholic fatty liver disorder, type 2 diabetes, and left-sided abdominal pain, and also includes ethnicity data. There is obviously a huge amount of overlap between these two data sets, but standardizing them such that a machine learning method could learn equally off e each of them would be hugely difficult, even in this example. The diagnoses have different coding systems, the ethnicities do not have the same support, and there are conditions that are not equivalent, meaning that there is a relationship between the conditions that exists, but is not well defined at this point. A CDM would ingest these disparate features and map them into a unified knowledge representation. This is shown in the gray panel in the center. Through this process, we would rectify those data complexities that I just discussed. Of note, this CDM could tell us that left-sided abdominal pain is a parent of upper left-sided abdominal pain. It captures that relationship and a model that we built could now exploit it. It also aggregates across varying forms of ethnicities to present a unified set, and it maps consistent concepts of varying source vocabularies into single concepts. What is important to take away from this is that machine learning methods learn from these entities and relationships, and we can hopefully maximize the utility of the model by learning from more data from different sources and data that is consistent with our knowledge of the world. So, if we take many data sources and apply a CDM to them, we get a set of standardized data sources. These can then go through an algorithm to produce inferences. But, because the input looks the same, the inferences are meaningfully comparable. And this can support the variety of tasks that we discussed before, including generalizability, transportability, reproducibility, and meta-analyses. And these, in total, provide reliable evidence. Recent research demonstrates the benefits of CDMs to methods work. There are a few papers here that might be of interest. This paper in particular by Duke et al. sought to determine the risk of angioedema associated with exposure to levetiracetam versus phenytoin. The authors took 10 datasets, over 600 million unique patients, and standardized the format into the Odyssey Common Data Model. Across the individual databases, the hazard ratio, or HR, of angioedema in levetiracetam versus phenytoin ranges from 0.43 to 1.31, with no significant findings. However, when meta-analyze, a task that was functionally supported by CDM, the results indicated a significant protective effect of levetiracetam versus phenytoin for angioedema. So, the CDM formatted data allowed the model to detect a causal relationship that was not seen in single site data. I've certainly touted CDMs for machine learning research, but there are, of course, limitations to such representations of data. Principally, increasingly complex health data, 
like that which we use in pharmaceuticals every day, requires increasingly complex data management. So databases can be bigger and more complex and require more specialized knowledge. Additionally, the Extract, Transform, and Load, or ETL, can be very difficult. Errors in the ETL process may impede the ability of models to learn from the data. Information loss from incomplete mapping can bias the data in unanticipated ways. CDMs further also focus on structured data, and some data modalities may not be supported, for example, genetic data or free text. And of course, there is required ontological maintenance to upkeep CDM quality. In all, CDMs standardize the representation of biomedical data. CDM formatted data supports good methodologies. It facilitates a larger pool of available data for machine learning models. It provides a single view of multiple data sets. And importantly, it accelerates an MLAI's methods time to value. One of the ways the CDMs does this is by reducing data cleaning time. And this is a really big one, and I do want to take a moment here because I'm sure many of you can commiserate. Data cleaning is really time-consuming and really unenjoyable. I'm sure some of you will remember this article that made the rounds a few years ago, which cited that 80% of a data scientist's time was spent cleaning data for analysis. Because CDM data is the same across many instances, this task can be made so much easier. Of course, as we discussed, inferences from CDM formatted data are meaningfully comparable, which can give better insights and make these models more impactful. And lastly, we can reuse code between CDM formatted datasets, which can continue to yield with minimal investment of time and energy. But as I noted earlier, the ETL process can be a barrier to implementation. If you're interested in reading more about this topic, here are the references that I used throughout my talk today. Thanks for your attention. I'll hang out for a few minutes after this talk to answer any questions that you may have. But if you think of something later on, please feel free to reach out to me via one of these methods on the screen.